Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. So, brand new series today, and as you can probably tell, Russia won the vote, which means we'll be covering America after this tree is done. If you're new, this is a series where we take a look at every tank tier for tier in the tree, work out how best to use it, and ultimately decide whether it's worth getting, considering, or avoiding for use in your lineups. And even for tier 1, there's a lot to get through today, so let's get into it. As always, I really hope you enjoy. So, starting off today, we have our first reserve tank, the very famous BT-5, a very lightly armoured but well-armed machine that also offers fantastic mobility. To generalise and not bog you down in loads of cold numbers, frontally it has around 20 to 25 millimetres of reliable armour in the majority of common spots will be shot, which is safe to say not really enough to consistently take fire and survive even from heavy machine guns. Although, despite its thin armour, because of a 40 millimetre thick segment on the lower plate, it can't be hull broken, which does somewhat add to its survivability. It's equipped with a very common gun for this tier, the 45mm 20K, which is one of the best starting guns in the game really. Its stock reload is 3.8 seconds and comes with two rounds, an APHE and an AP round. The solid armour piercing round doesn't really offer any practical advantages over the APHE. I can only really think of a few really specific situations where it would actually be worth using, so Overall, it's much better to stick with the stock APHE shell, as even for a 1.0 cannon, it's actually really good and can cut through a max of 70mm of flat armour, which is great for tier 1. On top of this, because of the Russian fuse, it's really good at penetrating through angled armour as well, making it a very reliable cannon overall. The mobility of the BT-5 is very good as well, it's one of the fastest tanks at the lower ranks, and can comfortably reach its top speed of 53km an hour off-road really really easily, allowing it to get around the map much faster than the majority of enemy vehicles. And using its mobility to full effect is really how you get the most out of the BT-5, because if you can get into a good position, the gun will basically do the rest of the work, there are very few enemies that you'll struggle to penetrate. You can even just play this thing on autopilot really, frontally there's only a tiny amount of enemy vehicles you can't take out, so you can just drive around until you meet an enemy and just try clicking on them before they click on you. So I don't want to present this tank in a way that implies it only works if you play to the strength of its mobility, although it does work best if you do. The BT-5 is one of the best reserve tanks to play if you're a complete beginner, because it lets you advance your knowledge in probably the most important aspect of the game, which is learning the maps. You can put a bad tank in a good spot and do better than an incredible tank in a bad spot, so the quicker you find out good areas of the maps to play in, the faster you'll find yourself getting good results. Because the BT-5 can so effortlessly cruise its way around the maps, you can use it to passively work out which areas of the map work and which don't, as this tank lets you reach further into the map before you see combat, which lets you engage enemies from many different positions. If you're completely new and starting the game with Russia, this is what I'd aim to do. All of the maps function so differently that I can't exactly tell you which areas to go for, but try and look at the minimap and work out where the bulk of each enemy team are going to engage each other. Basically, try and draw a line, or lines in your head, from both spawns into the cap points using the roads and the easiest routes to the location, and try and avoid positioning yourself in or directly around those lines. This is a huge generalisation and I can't pretend this will be constantly accurate, but the majority of enemies will likely be around these lines, especially at the lower tiers, as, well, it's basically what the game is incentivizing you to do. To win, you need to cap, so drive to the cap point, and you can safely predict this by working out the easiest route there. So what I'd aim to do is watch one of the lines you think a majority of enemy vehicles will take, and use the BT-5's mobility to push into the map around some cover, and watch the sight lines enemies could be driving through. This will of course be full of trial and error, but it's really the best way to learn the maps. Just make sure that the spot you pick to watch for advancing enemies has some form of escape route for you, either a hill you can drive behind or a defilade you can duck into. As the BT-5 can't really fall back on its survivability at all, every enemy you'll fight has the potential to cut through your armour, so if you are hit and you lose your breach or turret drive, you'll want to back out of the engagement as fast as possible. So it's always a really good idea to keep an escape route nearby if you can. Pros. Great mobility. Great firepower and versatile. The cons? Poor survivability. As this is your reserve vehicle, I can't really give you a verdict on whether you should use it in your lineup as, well, <laughs> you have to, but in any case, this is the tank you should take out as your first spawn when you start out. It isn't the most forgiving machine by a long shot, but it's very capable if you use it right and will definitely start you off on the right track with Russia. Just a little tank-themed joke for you there to kick off with. 
I shouldn't be proud of that, but I am in a way that I'm really embarrassed about. Anyway, moving on. Next up is a very similar tank, the BT-7, which functionally is almost exactly the same as the BT-5, but with a few changes, some for the better and some for the worse. For the better though, it gets an extra 35 horsepower in the engine. This doesn't really give it much of a higher top speed than the BT-5, but it is a lot more responsive and accelerates much faster. Its armour protection though is a little bit worse. The general armour layout is functionally the same, but it loses the 40mm lower plate so it can now hull break, meaning heat rounds and high calibre high explosive rounds will generally knock this tank out regardless of where they hit, which can make the BT-7 suffer, especially when put up against the German howitzers. It also has slightly worse gun depression as well at minus 6 degrees, whereas the BT-5 could reach minus 8, which does slightly limit the locations on the map where you can safely play this thing. It also has quite an annoying quirk with the suspension as well, and will oversteer at lower speeds. If you turn left or right, the BT-7 will continue to turn for a second or so after you've stopped the input, which can take some getting used to. From what I know, this is partially historical as the real suspension did somewhat behave this way, but it's still annoying nonetheless. So. The only real advantage in using the BT-7 over the 5 is that extra boost to the manoeuvrability. Again, this only allows for you to accelerate quicker and make tighter turns, and won't really let you reach positions in the map faster. So, in reality, it's not really that much better than the BT-5. As for playing it, the only difference really is to keep the gun depression in mind. It's not as good as the BT-5, so it can't use some of the same spots that tank could. So, playing it on terrain that's more flat would help out. It's also important to practice using spots on the map that work without needing to depress your gun very much, as a very common trait of Russian tanks is the lack of gun depression, so getting used to that now will set you up much better down the line. Apart from that, there's not really a lot else to add here really without going over exactly the same tactics as the BT-5. Despite the small differences, they basically play the same. Only real difference is that you need to be a bit more careful when playing the BT-7, especially if you're fighting the German Panzer IVs with a 75mm howitzer, as if the heat round they use hits you anywhere, you'll be hull broken and knocked out instantly. Pros, great mobility, great firepower, and versatile. The cons, poor survivability. And our verdict? Despite its apparent downgrades, it's still well worth using. It's really versatile, and much like the BT-5, it will let you better explore the maps than most of the other tanks you have access to at this BR. So, once you get around the dodgy steering, you'll definitely have a good time with this one too. Next up is the T-26, Russia's second reserve vehicle, and unlike the BT-5, this one isn't quite as useful. In fact, it doesn't really have any meaningful advantages over the BT. Firepower performance is identical, it uses the same gun with the same ammunition and reload, so no problems there. But its survivability is pretty poor. It's only protected by 15mm of flat armour on the hull, and 15 in the turret. The turret does have some sloping and angles that could potentially throw off some incoming shots, but overall the armour protection is pretty terrible. Mobility is much of the same as well, very poor. It can reach its top speed of 30km an hour off-road, but this isn't great. It also takes a while to accelerate to this speed, and it has a reverse gear of only minus 3km an hour, which is really terrible. So. Compared to the BT, the T26 doesn't really offer any advantages. You could maybe say the turret is better protected, but even that's pushing it really. It has no reliable armour protection, and it doesn't have the mobility to allow you to get into a good spot early in the match. Basically every enemy tank will be able to beat you to good spots in the map. So because of this, it's relegated to being almost purely a defensive vehicle, or more of a support tank. On the vehicle's merits alone, it doesn't really give you anything to make use of other than the gun, which is still really good, but you don't have the armour to potentially trade shots with any enemy. And also, the gun is very unstable on the move and when coming to a stop, so the gun will bounce and pivot when you hit the brakes, meaning you'll lose a few seconds on shooting an enemy. This is made even more of a problem because the T26 doesn't get a short shoulder stabiliser. Basically, all allied tanks with low-caliber guns around this battle rating have them, and what this does, basically, is level off the gun so it's perfectly still when the tank tanks that use it come to a stop, meaning that they can fire much faster and more accurately, so if you're driving around on the move and meet one of these enemies head on, chances are very high they'll be able to knock you out before you can even level the gun off. Because of all these drawbacks, the T26 can only really be used consistently defensively, in a static, stable position, watching over a cap point or commonly travelled route in the map. By staying still, you effectively negate all the disadvantages of this tank, albeit at the trade-off of playing the vehicle in such a way where you're unlikely to get many kills, but 
still, it'll keep you alive. Just try and find a spot around some cover and just wait for enemies to come to you. You can, of course, play it normally. I, I know normally isn't really a helpful or descriptive term, but I basically mean you can just drive around and click on tanks. You'll likely get knocked out before too long, but you can still get some kills just down to the firepower alone. So please don't think that you can only ever play it defensively. If the map or situation calls for it, you can be somewhat aggressive. It is impossible. You just might need to be a little bit more careful and passive. Pros? Great firepower, and the cons, poor survivability, poor mobility, and low versatility. Lots of abilities there. <laughs> anyway, again, I can't give a verdict on this one as you need to use it to start off, but I would say to take this out secondary to the BT-5, as in almost every map and situation, the BT-5 has more to offer. So think of this one more like a backup, really. It still works, but it's not quite as beginner-friendly, and you'd be actively limiting your potential and performance by choosing to play this over the BT-5. Next up is the T26-4, a variant which uses the same hull, but with a completely different turret and cannon. Mobility and armor thickness are functionally the same. The turret of this version is a little bit more flat though, so it's unlikely to bounce any shots. Anyway, of course, the main talking point here is the gun. This version uses a 76mm howitzer cannon, which has terrible penetration but huge damage potential. Stock, it comes with two rounds, an HE round which is pretty useless against armored targets, it's only really good for hull-breaking armored cars and SPA, and a shrapnel shell. Shrapnel shells in the game are basically just APHE with a different icon, really. It causes more fragments than APHE, but it doesn't have great penetration, so it's not really worth using after you actually unlock the APHE round. And speaking of, the actual unlockable APHE round this tank uses does have potential to work quite well. Its penetration is a bit better, but it has a feature that's a little overlooked, and that's that this round actually performs incredibly well against angles, which means that it can penetrate weaker angled armor much easier due to the caliber, cap, and fuse. So even if a tank is only slightly angled, most of the time you can get through the side armor. This means that if you can't penetrate the front armor of what you're shooting at, you could aim for the side armor instead and likely get a penetration. A good rule of thumb to have when using this vehicle is to try and shoot for the weakest part of the armor that you can reasonably hit, because the round will generally get through regardless of how high the angle is. The problem though is that there are a few tanks this thing can't deal with past a few hundred meters at all. It really struggles with the French tanks and a few of the Axis mediums requiring a really precise shot to be able to penetrate. The benefit though is that if you do penetrate you will more than likely get a one shot. The APHE round this tank uses has about five times the explosive mass of the 45mm gun we've seen so far, so a successful penetration will do a lot of damage. So the key really to playing this thing is to find a position where the gun is easiest to aim. The velocity is fairly low and the penetration over long ranges isn't consistent, so you're going to want to play this tank at relatively close range. Thankfully though, despite the calibre, its reload is still quite short. It's around one and a half seconds longer than the previous T26, so even if you miss, you can fire off another round fairly quickly. It does annoyingly have the same drawbacks as the previous T26 though, no armour and poor mobility, and even less versatility due to how the gun performs. This isn't much of a meaningful point as far as the game is actually concerned, but it's quite fun and satisfying to use when it does work, which is still a factor to consider really. It's really fun blowing tanks up with this thing, it just requires a bit of prerequisite knowledge on the vehicles you'll be fighting to be able to work properly. In any case, I'd aim to get the APHE round as soon as possible, and just try and camp around cap points really. This almost guarantees that you'll be seeing enemies at close range, which makes penetrating much easier. Engaging at long range, you're a sitting duck really, your armor is still very weak, and the gun is fairly hard to aim, so try and stick to cover and avoid sitting out in the open. And also, try and play around your teammates as well. If you run into a tank you can't knock out, at least you can hit them and mark them on the map for your team, who can then, hopefully, finish it off, and get you an assist as well, which is especially useful when you're stock and don't have access to the APHE round. Pros? High damage potential? And the cons, poor weapon handling, poor survivability, poor mobility, and low versatility. Verdict, this one will be a considerate. Just because, much like the T26, it's not really very beginner friendly and becomes redundant really quickly as well. You can't really take this thing out in battles above 2.3. And also, as it requires you to play with a stock round that can't frontally penetrate a lot of the vehicles at your battle rating, I'd really suggest putting the APHE round as the stock round, as it shouldn't be possible to run into enemies at your own BR that you have no way of frontally penetrating, which is a really negative experience for a beginner to the game. Not fun at all. But anyway, if you're confident and want some satisfying one-shots, this tank can genuinely be fun, but just bear in mind that it can be a bit tricky to use as well. 
Next up is the T60, a very tiny tank and quite a unique one functionally this tier as it uses a 20mm autocannon, which has quite questionable functionality. It fires very fast at 750 rounds per minute and has a fairly high magazine size of 58 rounds, but a very, very long reload of 26 seconds stock and fairly low penetration as well. It's actually only a tiny bit better than that of a 50 cal. Point blank, with a high velocity belt, it can cut through a max of 32 millimeters of flat armor, but this falls off very quickly as at only 100 meters, it can only get through 29 millimeters of flat armor. It will absolutely shred anti-air and light vehicles, but against the majority of medium tanks, it will definitely struggle. In its BR range, there are around 20 plus vehicles it can't penetrate from the front past 100 meters, which really makes playing it a bit of a gamble and quite an unnecessary one as you already have a lot of conventional tanks at this BR that deal with basically every enemy easily. Despite this though, it does have its advantages. It's not exactly well armoured, but well armoured enough to be able to survive a hit or two, especially when compared to the other 1.0s. The turret has around 20mm of reliable armour with some overlapping parts, with the hull having around 35-40mm to 40 millimeters effective. This thing can also be deceptively survivable when angled as well, specifically when angled with the engine side towards the enemy. This way, the engine and the extra track link make punching through to the crew inside really difficult. You might lose the engine doing this, but you'll likely stay alive a bit longer. The mobility as well isn't terrible. Not quite as fast as contemporary light tanks, but fast enough to get around the map quickly enough when upgraded. Its small size as well is also a factor worth mentioning, as you can use a lot more assets in the terrain to hide behind than most other vehicles, be it rocks, tank wrecks, or even sitting in bushes. As the lower tiers are generally populated by newer players, situational awareness is something a lot of them wouldn't have necessarily learned yet, meaning that you can use the terrain to camp a bit and let enemies get in close to you, which, due to the penetration fall off at range, is really where you want to be. This thing really only does well in urban environments and in extremely close quarters. It completely lacks the penetration to be reliably useful at range, so you really don't want to be in a position where enemies can snipe at you. Whatever map you find yourself on, try and stick close to cover and short sight lines, and just try and make it so that if an enemy comes into sight, they're as close to you as possible. Possible when you engage. If you see an enemy at a slight distance and you're not sure you can penetrate them, just don't fire. Either try and sneak closer or just let them carry on and engage them later. You really don't want to draw attention to yourself, especially from targets that you can't easily penetrate. If you do have the ability to get closer to an enemy before firing, do it, as this gives you a better chance of getting through the armor. Additionally, always flush your magazine to reload if you only have around 20 shots or so left, as you don't want to be caught on reload as it's a really long time to wait. So if your magazine is nearly empty, fire off the remaining shot while still in cover so that when you next engage an enemy, it's with a full magazine. Also, as this tank is equipped with an autocannon, you can somewhat use it to engage aircraft too. It's not amazingly good at this as the gun elevation is only 25 degrees, but if an aircraft is flying low, it'll only take one or two well-placed shots to bring down a low-tier plane so you could even use it chiefly as a substitute for a true anti-air vehicle this tier. This is also a good use for its stock, as the stock belt it gets is 1 to 1 HE to AP, and the stock AP round can only get through 27mm of armor maximum, so stock, it would be a good idea to either follow teammates around and blow off tracks to get the assist, or taking it out as a second spawn to have a go at taking out some low-flying planes as a pseudo-anti-air. Pros? Great against soft targets, and decent anti-air potential. And the cons, poor performance at range, inconsistent survivability, and low versatility. Verdict? I'll say consider it, just because it's possible to run into enemies that you can't even scratch, which really isn't fun gameplay at all. This thing is fantastic against light armor, but you can't guarantee you'll be meeting much of it. I really think that this thing now deserves a shorter reload, maybe even cutting it down to half, as back in the beta for tanks, this thing was pretty good and also had higher penetration as well, so it made sense that the reload was long to stop it rampaging. But now that there are loads more tanks running around that this thing can't even touch, giving it a shorter reload will at least eliminate an unnecessary and somewhat unfair drawback it has. This thing has the potential to work incredibly well, but it's also equally as likely to run into a tank that it cannot even damage from the front. In any case, if you like the more high-risk, high-reward style of gameplay, this thing might be worth spading. Next up is the T-70, another very widely produced machine that has quite a temperamental performance in-game. It uses the same 45mm gun as previous vehicles, but it gets access to a new round, an APCR shot, which has high penetration but very poor damage. And it's only really useful when fighting against really tough tanks like the French heavies and some of the British. 
Overall though, even at 2.0 and above, the APHE is still the round you should be maining. Mobility this time around is pretty decent. It's in the middle ground between the T26 and the BT series really. Not really fast, not really slow, but decent enough. The main balancing factor of this tank though is the armour, which on the surface is pretty good. The turret is 50mm thick, and the hull is effectively around 65mm thick, apart from the driver's port which is a little bit weaker. So overall its protection is pretty good, but its survivability isn't. This tank only has two crew, meaning that if a shot penetrates either the turret or hull, the tank will be knocked out. Also, because of the lack of loader, the reload is longer than most of the other tanks that use the 45 as well. It's around one and a half seconds slower. It also has a much slower turret traverse at 3.6 degrees a second, which is terrible, nearly three times slower than that of the BT and T26 series. Additionally, because of the center of mass, the gun is very unstable on the move and when coming to a stop, and will commonly rock heavily when the brakes are applied, much like the T26, but a lot worse. So. Really, all this tank has going for it is the armour protection. There are a few tanks that can't penetrate this thing frontally at all, and past around 500 metres, there aren't many tanks that can actually get through. The only vehicles that reliably can are the British, Americans and the Swedish if they use Sabo, and as well the German 75mm guns if they use heat. So you can be pretty safe from the majority of enemies with this thing if you engage at range, and as well if you're not up to too much. Above 2.7, this thing's armour becomes a little less effective, and also much like the T60, remember to angle slightly with the engine towards the enemy as it might save you from time to time. Especially so as this makes the weaker armour by the driver's port less of an issue. So, it has some pretty big advantages and disadvantages. If you're confident, you can play this thing quite aggressively as a lot of enemies will struggle to penetrate you, although you could just as easily run right into an enemy that will have no trouble cutting through your armour at all. So, it is a bit of a gamble that could potentially pay off. Much like the T26 though, this thing works quite consistently defensively at range, as this nullifies a lot of its drawbacks. The armour is more reliable, and the lack of turret traverse isn't as much of an issue at range as you can effectively cover more ground while turning your turret less. And again, if you're engaging from a stationary position, the rocking of the hull isn't an issue either. So this way of fighting can be quite effective, but it won't always be the most interesting as you might go minutes without seeing an enemy. If camping at range isn't an option, try and find a position that makes enemies come to you. So much like the T26, you can engage them from a static position. So try watching a cap or choke point and be very aware of enemies on your flanks as you'll be very slow to react to them due to the bouncy gun and the terribly slow turret traverse. So try not to be too aggressive, especially if you're not sure which tanks can actually pose a threat to you. If you're confident with the enemies you fight, you can afford to push the tanks that you know have basically no way of penetrating you, but if you're not so familiar with the enemies you could face, being a bit more defensive is probably the way to go. In any case, try and keep the bulk of enemies directly in front of you. That way your armor should hold up a little bit longer. Pros, good firepower, decent mobility, and good armor. And the cons? terrible turret traverse, and poor survivability. Verdict? I would get this one. It won't always work, but when it does, it has the potential to work really, really well. So, as long as you're aware of your surroundings and can avoid getting flanked, this thing does have a fair bit of potential. Next is our first and only tank destroyer in the main tree this tier, the SU-51 which looks fairly primitive, but does have a very effective gun, which in game functions exactly the same as the F-34 cannon used on the later T-34-76s. The APHE round it uses can cut through a max of 86 millimeters of armor and contains 150 grams of explosive filler, so safe to say, 90% of the times you actually penetrate a tank, it will one-shot. The drawback though, and it is a pretty big drawback, is that this vehicle can only carry eight rounds of ammunition, which is a tiny, tiny amount. On top of this, it suffers a lot in the armor and mobility fields as well. Its mobility is very similar to the T26, as they share the same chassis, so not great. And the armor as well is much the same, only 15 millimeters of frontal armor. Because it's open topped, it can also hull break, so if you get hit by HE or heat, it'll go up in one shot. It does, however, have five crew members that are fairly spread out in the crew compartment, so it's possible to survive a few shots from lower caliber guns, as there's no real way they'll be able to take out all the crew in a single shot, so it can be artificially survivable that way. The SU-51 has one of the most effective guns of this tier, so all you really need to do is get it into a position where it can fire at enemies, and the gun will really just do the rest, it's just that effective. There's basically no tank at this BR that you can't deal with, but as you only have 8 rounds, you need to make every shot count. 
so try and aim for centre mass on most of the tanks you fight. This way the spread of damage should fill the whole interior and take them out in one shot. Additionally, I'd only take a full loader of the APHE round, you'll basically never need to use the AP. As far as positioning goes, you do have a few options. Close range and long range both have advantages. Engaging at long range will keep you the most safe, as hitting you will be harder from the enemy's perspective, but it will also be harder to land your shots, which, if you miss, is a really big problem for this vehicle. And also, once your ammo runs dry, you'll have to drive out of cover to a cap point to rearm, likely forcing you out into the open with no ammo, making you very, very vulnerable. At close range though, you're much easier to flank and knock out, but landing your shots will be easy, and if you're at close range, you're likely closer to a cap point as well, so of course rearming will be much easier. Playing like this also potentially lets you stick close to your team, and you will need their support if you run out of ammo. Whichever you choose though, I would stick close to cover. Of course, because this <laughs> gives you cover, but especially from aircraft, as any plane in the game has the potential to strafe out your exposed crew. So try and avoid playing out in the open, as if an aircraft is up and they see you, they will always give you a hard time. Basically, stick to cover and watch a well-travelled sightline or choke point. You can knock out anything that comes around that corner, so all you really need to do is put yourself in a spot that'll see enemies, and the gun will just do the rest. Pros, great firepower, and the cons, poor survivability, poor mobility, and low ammo count. And the verdict, I would definitely get this one. The low ammo count might be a turn-off if you look at it on paper, but this tank allows for an advantage not given by any of the others at this battle rating, and that's the ability to work in up tiers. This gun works well beyond its rank, so if you're on a map or up tier to the point where the weaker 45mm guns won't work too well, this always will. You might not last very long, but if you can reach a good spot, you can easily get some kills and enough points to get you into a plane. It might look weak, but it's well worth using. Next up are our anti-air vehicles, and they're a little primitive this tier to say the least. Starting off we have the Gaz AAA-4M, which is basically a gas truck with a quad mounting of 7.62 Maxim machine guns. These guns aren't terrible, but they're almost purely useful against aircraft, they have practically no use against any armour. They can only penetrate 10mm max, so regarding ground vehicles, they only really have viability against open-topped vehicles and very, very lightly armoured tanks. Against aircraft though, they're not too bad, but are quite hard to aim and don't do a huge amount of damage. You'll need to connect a burst of rounds into an aircraft to cause enough structural damage to bring it down. A deflection shot will likely not do much damage unless you get very lucky with a pilot snipe or fire. Because of this, you're going to need to wait until an enemy aircraft gets close to you to start firing, as getting the lead at range is quite tricky and if an enemy sees you firing, they're just going to evade. I'm not a great anti-air player, so what I generally do is wait until an aircraft is getting close and flying in a relatively straight line, and then fire off a burst and just hope that that burst brings the plane down. If you fire a burst and miss, the enemy aircraft is now aware of you, knows roughly where you are, and will make it very difficult for you to hit them. And this is especially a problem for the 4M, because a glancing hit will likely not bring an aircraft down, so you really need to make that initial burst count. The 4M doesn't have an angular dead zone, it can traverse 360 degrees, but it just can't fire upwards, and if an enemy aircraft is aware of you and knows this, they can just fly right above you, dive down and strafe you out, which is really easy for them to do, as this thing only has around a millimetre of steel protecting the cabin. So, overall it's a pretty weak anti-air. Although, it doesn't ever need to reload, which is a plus. Each gun has a thousand rounds each, and there's no way you're going to run out of ammo for it, really. As for where to play it, just stick around your spawn, really. It's unlikely you'll run into an enemy tank you can knock out with the machine guns, so tank hunting really isn't a viable choice for this one. Just stick to cover and wait for enemies to get close before you start firing, and you should pick up a few kills. Pros, decent anti-air ability, and the cons, poor anti-tank ability, low damage output, and poor survivability. Verdict, this one will be a considerate just for the reason that we have one more anti-air to cover which could be a better fit for you. They both have their advantages, so wait until you see them both to decide which one to pick. The 4M isn't a bad start though, and will be able to take out the slow, weakly armoured biplanes and early bombers around this BR. Our second anti-air is the Gaz AAA DSHK, uh, which is the name of the 50 cal machine gun that it uses. As it's also 1.0, it offers an alternative to the 4M Gaz in that this version can somewhat go after tanks. The unlockable belts contain an armour-piercing cement core round that can cut through 27mm of armour, which isn't that awful for what it is. It can take out a lot of tanks from the side, and a few very lightly armoured vehicles from the front. As for its anti-air potential, you could argue it's somewhat worse than the 4M. 
The rounds it uses are good though, they do do a lot of damage. The main round you want to use against aircraft is the orangey coloured round, the armour piercing incendiary tracer. However, the magazine is only 50 rounds which will get expended quite quickly. As well as this, the machine gun also has some dead zones. It can only traverse around 180 degrees, it can't fire over the back of the truck in any case, which can be really annoying for tracking an enemy plane if it flies behind you. The reload is also fairly long for what it is at 10.4 seconds stock, which for comparison, it takes the gunner of this anti-air longer to replace the one magazine that it takes the loader on the Wind to load four individual 20mm cartridges. Perhaps something is amiss here. Anyway, uh, this means you could get caught out on reload if an aircraft is strafing you, which, as like the previous AA, it's just a truck, no armour. This machine gun as well isn't quite easy to aim. It might just be my monitor, but I personally really struggle to see the tracers on this gun. They're quite thin and tricky to actually get the lead. As well, this in tandem with the small magazine size, by the time you actually get the correct lead on shooting an enemy aircraft, you might have already expended your magazine, which can be really tedious. So, safe to say really, this one is better to use against ground targets and to have a bit of versatility, and the 4M you could say is better against aircraft, they both really do have their merits. Anyway, pros, decent anti-tank ability, and decent anti-air ability. And the cons, poor turret traverse, long reload, small magazine size, and poor survivability. Verdict, as I hinted at on the last one, uh, again, consider it. This AA is a bit harder to use against aircraft, but can knock out some tanks potentially, and if that seems like it's of more use to you, then this version is likely the one to go for. And alternatively, if you just want an anti-air purely to fight aircraft, then go with the 4M. It's all down to preference, really. There's no right or wrong answer. So next up are our premiums, and Russia in tier 1 actually has the same amount of vehicles in the premium tree than it does in the tech tree, uh, so a fair few to get through. In any case, we're starting off with a rare one, the BA-11. This armoured car was a reward for completing a set amount of tasks in the last season of World War Mode, and is now only available on the marketplace for a fairly high price of around 100 euros at the moment, so this thing really is only a collector's vehicle. It performs fine, but doesn't really offer anything over the BT series of tanks, it uses the same gun and has around the same top speed, so you aren't really missing out on much. I would bet money though that we'll soon be seeing the much wider produced version of the BA-10 in the tech tree. With the recent economy changes of freeing up space in the lower tiers, it seems like this vehicle is inevitable, especially as they've already put the money into modelling the BA-11. I'm almost certain the 10 will arrive in game soon, so sit tight and a vehicle very similar to this one will hopefully come around soon. Hopefully. Next up, a very unique machine, this is the RBT-5. A standard BT-5, but with two tank torpedoes strapped to the side of the turret. These basically function as launchable 250kg bombs that will knock out anything you hit, even top tier MBTs. They're very annoying to aim though, as by default they're angled upwards to land at around 250 meters away, so you can't really use them against close range targets. If you want to, you'll have to angle yourself on a piece of terrain. When this tank was first released, you were able to fire on targets directly in front of you, and to be honest, it was completely overpowered. You could effortlessly take out any vehicle in the game. This vehicle was first released as a prize for the Thunder League esports tournament. If you bought a dog tag, you could bet on which team you wanted to win the tournament, and if they won, you got this tank. It's now currently available on the marketplace for around 80 euros, and you can potentially win it from the camo boxes, although please don't throw money away trying to get it out of one, as it's really unlikely one will drop. It's a fun tank to take out sometimes, but in practice it is a bit annoying and tedious to use. Basically, it looks like it's more fun than it is. If you want to see how the rockets work though, you can see a simulation in the protection analysis, which admittedly can be quite fun to play around with. Next up, a tank some of you might recognise, this is the M3 Medium, or the M3 Lee, a Lend-Lease American tank. It's currently available on the marketplace for around 5 euros, so it's not very rare. It is another vehicle that's fairly temperamental at 2.7 though. Like the T-70, it works great at its battle rating, but does suffer a lot when up-tiered and loses almost all of its armour advantages. The guns though are pretty good. It has a fast-firing 37mm in the turret that has low damage but high penetration, and the secondary 75mm hull cannon which has great penetration and great damage. In tandem, they both work very well, but will take some coordination. I would almost recommend picking one up for yourself, but the problem is that it just doesn't really work at all past its battle rating and gets eaten alive most of the time in 3.7 matches, so 
it doesn't have much longevity and if you're putting money into the game you're going to want that money to last and this thing won't really. You can of course have some great games potentially even in up tiers but most of the time it will be temperamental. Plus there are more tanks to get through that will work a lot better. If you have a fiver lying around I wouldn't necessarily say it would be a waste to pick this thing up but I really think there are some better choices for a cheaper price. Next up is our last marketplace tank, the T26E. This is basically a regular T26, but with some additional armor plates protecting the hull and turret. The protection it has is okay, but it does make the tank very, very slow to accelerate, and the T26 wasn't exactly speedy in the first place. The armor adds around 30mm of protection, making the general armor thickness around 45 to 50mm overall, and this will stop a fair few of the low tier guns from being able to get through if you angle. As the driver's port has no protection, you need to angle away from that side, but if you do, the hull and turret are pretty well protected, but it's still quite likely that you'll run right into an enemy that will have no trouble getting through even with the extra protection, which can be quite tedious as this thing doesn't really feel fun to drive. It feels almost like you're driving around a heavy tank, but without any of the advantages of one. So again, it's quite temperamental, it either works great or not at all. It's on the marketplace for around 13 euros, so it's a bit more of a collectible really, and as such you won't really miss too much by skipping it. First for our Golden Eagle premiums this tier is the first GVTBR T26. All this is is an identical T26 to the standard reserve vehicle, although this one has a special unique winter camo and no other changes really. Given the less than stellar overall performance, I wouldn't really recommend you go for this one even with its low price of 250 Golden Eagles. It's also the free premium you receive for picking Russian tanks as your starter nation. Plus, you could effectively get the same result with this thing by just buying a talisman for the regular T26, which only costs 80 Golden Eagles, a fraction of the price really. Plus, I'd say there are better tanks to talisman this tier if you really want one anyway. So, safe to say, this one isn't really worth going for despite how cheap it is. Next up really is the monster of tier 1, this is the T-35 heavy tank, commonly and fairly accurately referred to as a land battleship and it really lives up to that name. Having 3 cannon turrets and 2 machine gun turrets and a total of 10 crew, it can really devastate the enemy team if it doesn't get overwhelmed. It uses two 45mm turrets, with the main turret housing the same gun as the T26-4, the howitzer. So, it has a fair bit of versatility regarding firepower and can cover basically every angle at once. Its overall armour isn't that great though, the turrets are around 20mm thick, with the hull front being 30. Its survivability really just comes from the high crew count and the spaced armour, as if you angle the hull towards your enemies, its likely incoming rounds will get stuck in the turret blisters. The side armour is actually fairly decent as well, as it has some spaced parts, and the tracks and road wheels will pretty often catch incoming shots. So overall, it really is a beast, but carries a rather beastly price of 2,100 golden eagles, which is really way too expensive to pay for a premium tank to grind with, especially this tier. It's more expensive than most tier 2 premiums and even one tier 3 premium, so this one is only really worth going for if you want to spend a lot of time with low tier Russia. It can be really fun, but staying so low won't be for everyone. In any case, I'd only really recommend getting this thing on a discount, as it is a lot to pay. It's also a bomb magnet as well, so you better believe that any incoming aircraft is going to beeline right for you to try and bomb you. Enemies just love trying to take this thing out, so you will get a fair bit of attention. It also doesn't work too well above 2.0 either, as you'll start seeing tanks that can easily cut this thing apart. It is almost guaranteed to get a few kills before you're taken out though. It's a lot of fun, but as fun as a concept has a different value for everyone, I can't really say if this tank is worth it for fun. As a grinder though, I wouldn't really recommend it. You could buy a talisman for every tank in the main tree this tier, and have some golden eagles left over for the same price as the T-35. So if you only want to put money into this game to grind, I would sadly skip this one. Next up, a pretty unconventional machine, the BM-824, which carries 24 M8 rockets on the hull of the T-60. It's certainly an interesting vehicle, but in practice it doesn't really live up to expectations. The main problem really is that the rockets just don't do much damage, or rather they don't do much damage to the majority of enemy tanks. A single rocket can hull break a light enemy vehicle, but as it only has 24mm of penetration, there are a lot of vehicles it can't even scratch, even from the side. And as it's a 2 3 vehicle, you can quite easily find yourself in 3.3 matches and it really starts to suffer there too. The depression of the rails is also a problem, they can only angle down at minus 3 degrees, making it sometimes impossible to hit a target with a low silhouette, even if it's only just a few metres in front of you, which really isn't fun. 
It's also quite hard to aim accurately in general, the rockets leave a pretty thick smoke trail which in most cases completely blocks off your view, so if you need the rocket to land in a weak spot you can't really aim for it accurately. And also, the final of many nails in the BM8's coffin is the price. At 3,850 golden eagles there is absolutely no reason to really buy this and like I said in the German guide regarding the Panzerwerfer, I don't really think Gaijin expect you to buy it. The BM8 along with the other rocket vehicles is a login reward. On certain days you can win an hour's test drive for it and I think that's its chief purpose. The reason for the price given by Gaijin years and years ago when it was introduced was that they wanted to limit the number of rocket vehicles on the battlefield, which is a somewhat fair point, uh, but it just has so many other factors that make it entirely and unfairly ineffective. It's too much money to be worth it for a grinder, it's only tier 1 so it can only research tier 2 effectively, and it's placed at a battle rating where it will still easily meet tanks it can't even damage from the front or even the side. It's still very much possible to have some great games in it, but it just isn't worth it for the money. And like the RBT-5, it looks like it's more fun than it is. Maybe it'll be more viable if the battle rating was bumped down, but even then it still isn't worth the price, your money can be much better spent. It's a really interesting and unique machine, but it's just implemented in such a way that makes it practically redundant from the offset. Next up is a captured tank, the T3, which is a German Panzer 3J. I did cover this vehicle in the first episode of the German Tech Tree review, so if you'd like a more in-depth look, please feel free to give it a watch. Briefly though, the 3J can be fairly good. It has 50mm of frontal armour which you can buff up to 60 on the front and sides by angling. It comes equipped with a 50mm cannon, which really has quite similar performance to the Russians' own 45mm, uh, but it's still good in any case. Its mobility as well is fairly decent, it's not the fastest in a straight line, but it accelerates very well and can manoeuvre and change direction quite easily. Its reverse gear is also pretty effective too. The downsides though are its battle rating and turret traverse. On a stock crew, the turret traverse is only 3.8 degrees a second which really puts you at risk from enemies on your sides, and severely passively limits your reaction times. And also, at 2.3 it's in a fairly tricky spot. At 2.3 to 2.7 it can work great, but anything above Above that and the armour really starts to let it down, and the gun will stop being as consistent too. It can be a somewhat reliable brawler though, which is something that tier 1 Russia doesn't have, although in tier 2 at a lower battle rating is a vehicle that can brawl quite well that we'll get into next time. For 700 golden eagles, this thing wouldn't be a bad buy, it adds something unique to the tree and can be a decent vehicle for the lower tiers. There's still one more vehicle to cover though which I think is a little bit better than this one, but in any case if you think this sort of tank would suit your playstyle it certainly wouldn't be a mistake to buy it. Finally, our last premium, the SU-57. Sadly not the Sukhoi, but still a pretty good vehicle nevertheless. In my opinion, this is one of the most slept on vehicles in the lower tiers as it functions really, really well. It's an American Lend-Lease half-track with no armour, but with one of the most reliable guns at the lower tiers, the M1 57mm. It functions a lot like the 6-pounder, but with APHE, and the APHE round it gets is great. It can punch through a max of 122mm of armour while having 42 grams of explosive filler. It's easy to aim and reloads very fast, and at 2.3 you can easily cut through and usually one-shot any vehicle you come across. On top of this, it's pretty speedy too and can easily reach 40km an hour off-road. It's also one of the cheapest this tier, being only 550 golden eagles. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say that picking this vehicle up is necessary, but I would say that relative to the price and its performance, it's the best premium this tier, simply down to its viability and up tiers. Basically, all the other premiums this tier don't do that well when fighting higher tier tanks, which means they're outclassed by other tech tree vehicles in the tree very, very quickly. But this one really isn't. It works well beyond its tier, which means you can get a lot more use out of it. It, of course, can't be used to research tanks above tier 2 effectively, but until then it's a great little grinder. Basically no other Russian vehicle around this BR combines a great gun with great mobility. You could argue that a couple of them come close, but the SU-57 really is the best in my opinion, the gun just is fantastic. The downsides though are that it has no armour and limited turret traverse, so it will require a bit of map knowledge to use effectively. If in doubt though, stick to long range. The gun is pretty easy to aim over distances and is fairly accurate too, and will generally hold enough penetration power to cut through whatever you're shooting at. 
So sniping with it is a good way to play. It keeps you out of sight and therefore less likely to be hit, and lets you reposition easily if you do get spotted. It can work at close range too, but you will need to be a bit more careful, especially from artillery, as this thing will get ripped apart by it. I'd say this vehicle is definitely worth it for the price. It's fun and unique and can be used well beyond its tier as well, which is really important for a premium. You may need to play it a bit carefully to get the most out of it, but overall it really is worth it. So that's all the tanks for today. Finally, we're going to cover the aircraft best suited for close air support around this battle rating, and we're starting off with the I-15 Biz, a very manoeuvrable biplane armed with four machine guns and the ability to carry rockets, RS-82s and RBS-82s. RS rockets are high explosive and don't really do much damage, but the RBS models are APHE rockets and will basically one-shot anything if they penetrate. They are quite hard to aim though. A lot of CAS aircraft around this BR use these, so I'll go into how best to use them a bit here. You need the rocket to actually penetrate the armour to do damage. A direct hit on a poor angle won't really be enough, so the best thing to do is to attack from an angle that presents as much of the tank's silhouette as possible. This is usually a low sweeping pass from the side. Also, make sure you aim by the wing. What I mean is don't aim the crosshair right in the middle of the tank, as the rockets will likely land either side. Instead, try and position yourself at a slight angle so that one rocket on either wing hits, as really you only need one to hit. Give it some practice in the test flight and once you get the hang of how they work, you can really start picking up some kills. The I-15 itself is really nimble and will allow you to easily get a good approach to the target, all the while being a fairly effective fighter as well. For 1.0 it's a really good start. Next up is the BB-1, an attacker. It's fairly slow and unwieldy, but has a gunner, four machine guns, and access to bombs, either two 250kg bombs which drop together, or six 100kg bombs. Both loads have their uses, although it will take some getting used to as the bombs overall are quite small. But in any case, if you don't really like rockets, the BB-1 is a good attack aircraft to start out with, as it can potentially get a few ground kills and then still cut down some enemy aircraft too. It doesn't have heaps of potential, but it will get the job done. Next up, back to the biplanes with the I-153 Chaika, which basically is like a high-powered I-15. It's faster, more maneuverable, and comes with faster firing machine guns and eight rockets instead of the I-15-6. This thing and its premium counterpart is great. It can easily tackle any fighter in the airspace and pick up a few ground kills too once you get the hang of the rockets. This is really one of the most capable aircraft this tier, so don't overlook it just because it's a biplane. It really has a lot of potential in every field. Next up are the LAG series of aircraft. There's a few in game and they're all slightly different, but their CAS ability is the same across the board. It can carry six of the RBS rockets and comes with two nose mounted guns, a 20mm cannon and a 50 cal. These guns have the potential to cut through just under 30mm of armour, and at this tier, this means you can quite easily use the guns to rip through the roof armour of every vehicle you meet if you use the ground target belt. And this makes the lags really versatile at taking out aircraft and tanks as well. And also, if you really don't like the rockets, it can carry 200kg bombs as well. The aircraft suffers a little bit at low speeds, so try and keep your energy up above the battlefield and you can be a real menace to every type of vehicle. Lastly is a pure bomber, the SB-2M-103. It's quite unwieldy and doesn't like manoeuvring, but it can carry three 500kg bombs with two drops. Because the tanks around this battle rating are quite light and the bombs are so big, you don't really need a direct hit to take them out, which means you can quite easily pick up a few kills using this thing. It has a really large wing area, which makes it quite weak to anti-air and fighters, but if the sky is clear, you can easily pick up a couple of kills with this thing if bombers are more your style. So there we are guys, that's everything for today. Really hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, on screen now are the best lineups I think you can make using vehicles from Tier 1 Russia. Bear in mind though that there are some tanks in Tier 2 that would work in these lineups better. Um, I will do the whole thing at the end and just show overall uh, what the best lineups are when the series is done. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the first episode of this new series. Uh, sorry if my voice has been dying a little bit, I've done all of these in one sitting and it's starting to really great on me, so I'm going to quickly drink some tea. Mm horrible and cold. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, as far as the shop is concerned, I will hopefully be opening that back up when the UK comes out of lockdown um, and I can start posting stuff again because the only trouble really is that the postal system in other countries is a little bit inconsistent at the moment and I wouldn't want anything to get lost. So just to be safe, that's why it's still offline, but I am still framing stuff up. So when it does come back online, there'll be loads of stuff available, um, all kinds of stuff. I've got a mount cutter as well, so I can now frame anything in the world, even beans. So 
yeah, hopefully that'll be something you like when it comes back online. Uh, anyway, I will let you get on with your day, night, evening, whatever, and um, I will see you in the next episode. So thank you very, very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.